All right, so Capers Island's been eroding 15 to 30 feet a year since 1875. And erosion happens when basically a barrier island is losing more sand than it's gaining. And actually when a sand, is, a barrier island is losing sand, somewhere else is gaining sand and you have deposition going on. Um, so Capers is one of the greatest examples of erosion in our state. It's constantly eroding away. Every time a wave comes in, it picks up sand and carries it somewhere else. Have you ever been swimming out in the ocean before and you're floating out there in the water and you end up about 100 yards down from where you left your beach towel? That's called the longshore current or the longshore transport. That's the same thing that the, bar the, the sand is doing along the islands on South Carolina's coast. The strongest current is usually from the north to south. So sand is constantly getting picked up by waves and moving down our beaches from one barrier island to the next. The longshore transport. Did you know that there's a nut, the amount of sand that moves down South Carolina beaches in one year is enough to fill the Williams Bryce Stadium full of sand in one year. That's how much sand moves down our beaches. So usually one island's eroding away, maybe one end's eroding away, another end you have deposition going on where it's building back up. So what type of island are we on? What type of island is Capers Island? It's a barrier island. And geologists say barrier islands are fairly young in geologic time. They say they formed between four and 6,000 years ago. So what's the first ingredient needed to form a barrier island? You might have guessed, it's sand. And uh, I, when I was a little boy and I used to come to the beach, I never really thought about where all the sand came from. It was fun to play in, make sand castles, but what did this sand actually used to be? Where did it come from? You might say rocks, and if you say rocks, you're correct. But if you walk around the low country here, you're not gonna find any rocks. You might find some sediment sedimentary rocks, but not the really hard, igneous rocks that you normally think about. So these, this sand actually is minerals from the rocks, in the, from the biggest rocks in South Carolina, which are the Appalachian Mountains. Those mountains have been eroding, weathering away for a long, long time. What causes weathering? Well, weathering is caused by freezing and thawing, water, uh, roots from plants breaking apart. Have you ever been up in the mountains or maybe seen pictures of the streams up there, the nice pretty waterfalls? Well, those little streams, those little creeks become streams, the streams become rivers, and the rivers, where does all that water flow? It all ends up at our coast. And as those, that water's been flowing, those uh, rocks up there have been eroding away those igneous rocks mostly granite the minerals from those rocks have made their way all the way down here to our coast and built up our barrier islands which is called deposition these barrier islands are probably the greatest examples of deposition we have in South Carolina because the rock the minerals the sediment flowed all the way down here to the coast and the wave action piled it up and built up these barrier islands. The first step in the formation of a barrier island after you get an accumulation of sand is a rack line right here. So you can tell where the high tide came in today, stopped and went back out. We're out of the beach right now at low tide. It's a great time to come out and explore. In about four hours, the tide's coming in, uh, about four or five hours, it's already been coming in for about two hours. So every six hours, the tide comes in, stops and goes back out. And uh, so this morning it was high, high tide, went back out for six hours, and now it's slowly coming back in. Sometimes you can see where the tide went even higher, pushed all those logs and rack way up there when we had a, a full moon or a new moon or a big storm, when you have your highest tides. So the first step after accumulation of sand is this rack line. It's where the tide comes in, stops, goes back out. The wind blows the sand down the beach and it will cover up these dead sticks of marsh grass. And we're gonna talk more about this stuff when we go back in the salt marsh. This is dead Spartana grass from the salt marsh. It washes up here, and so the sand will blow the wind down the beach, cover up these dead sticks, and if it's up high enough, like up there, um, high enough from the high tides, 
then when a seed from a dune plant lands in there, as that marsh grass is decomposing underneath the sand, that gives nutrients for when a seed from a dune plant lands in there, its roots can spread out, have some nutrients, anchors the sand in place, and that's the beginning of, the sand, of a sand dune. More rack blows on top of that, more sand on top of that. The roots from the dune, the dune plants keep spreading out and anchor the sand in place. That's why when you're on a beach, you never want to walk you want to stay on the beach path. You don't want to walk, tromp on those plants in the sand dunes. They're very fragile. The roots are holding those, that sand in place. And sand dunes, just like barrier islands, are the first line of defense against storms coming off the ocean for the mainland. Sand dunes are the first line of defense against the high tides from the ocean. And if you look along here, Capers Eye on the front beach, with all the erosion, we don't have sand dunes. So that's what happens when you don't have sand dunes. Every time it's high tide, it goes into the forest and washes out the, the sand underneath the trees and flows back out. But all these barrier islands originally started as an accumulation of sand and then a system of sand dunes. And then eventually um, salt tolerant plants like wax myrtles and yopon hollies and our state tree, the cabbage palmetto, uh, live oak trees, they all start to grow and that's what makes up the maritime forest or forest by the sea. If we were to walk from one in the beach to the salt marsh, it's not flat. You would think here in the low country it would be flat, but it's not. If, especially a barrier island that's not developed and hasn't been leveled or anything, you're actually going to go up a hill and down a hill, up a hill and down a hill. Those are old dune ridges. And between those old dune ridges, we have fresh water that will collect, rain water. Some of them were, are actually low enough where you actually have some spring water. And that's where the fresh water comes that supports a lot of the wildlife that lives out here on these barrier islands, like the white-tailed deer, the raccoons, the American alligator. They have to have fresh water. And uh, numerous other wildlife make, this, make these barrier islands their home. Check out this big chunk of mud doing on the front beach. Uh, this is a great example of how barrier islands move over time. This mud is actually old salt marsh pluff mud. And there was oysters. This was, was marsh grass growing out of it at one time. And there's oysters in here, clams. Um, so when you see old marsh mud on the front side of a barrier island, that tells you how much this barrier island has actually moved over time. That shows you that because salt marsh cannot survive on the front side of a barrier island. The reason why we have salt marshes is because the barrier islands are protecting it from the waves, the pounding of the ocean and the sand. So when you see salt marsh on the front side of a barrier island, that tells you that this actually used to be the back side. What today is the front side used to be the back side. I'm not sure exactly how long that take, hundreds, thousands of years, but we know it takes a long time because the sand would have had to cover up this salt marsh. These trees would have had a, this whole forest, maritime forest would have had to have grown and formed. And now with the erosion, it's washing away the sediment. The trees are falling down and it's exposing old, old sediment from a long time ago. One time we actually found a fossilized sperm whale skull in the same chunk of mud right here. Um, so uh, it's really amazing and also what we find out here a lot of times on the beach is pottery, Native American pottery we will find mixed in here. And uh, we know the Native Americans weren't like us where they like to have beachfront houses because it was more of a brutal environment to live on the front of beach and also not nearly as much food. They lived on the backside in the salt marsh. So there's actually shell middens that are washing out here um, where we're finding bits of pottery, shell middens, or trash piles from the Native Americans. And that's also evidence that this actually used to be the backside of the barrier island because we know the Native Americans lived on the edge of the marsh, not on the front side of a barrier island.